This is episode 478 of the Locked on Texas Rangers podcast. I'm here today to talk about World Series Game 2, but more importantly, two Rangers being absolutely snubbed, absolutely snubbed for the Golden Glove Awards this season. I'm ticked. Let's get into it. You are Locked on Rangers. Your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On the Texas Rangers. I'm your host, Bryce Patrick, here today to talk about the Gold Glove Awards and how they make me so irrationally angry every year. Every year I think, oh yeah, these awards are so stupid. They're obviously not well thought out. Whoever is voting on them hasn't seen a single baseball game most of the year. Probably doesn't even look at numbers, just like, I don't know, this guy is a guy I've heard of, and so I'll pick him. But thank you for making Locked On Rangers your first listen of the day. Now, the finalists were announced for the Gold Glove Awards today, and uh, I got some real thoughts on this year's um, nominees, including two Rangers who are absolutely snubbed. The Rangers had two Gold Glovers last year. Um and you know, started the year with three Gold Glove caliber people: Trader Wade, Joey Gallo, um, but Isaiah Connor Falefa very rightly deserved to win the Gold Glove award last year. Um, didn't have as great a season, but still a really, really good season defensively, full time at shortstop, one of the best in baseball, and absolutely got snubbed. Deserved to be among those three finalists in the American League for the. AL Gold Glove for the shortstop. But let me just read the nominees for all these different positions. Catcher in the American League, we got Martin Maldonado of the Astros, Sean Murphy of the A's, and of course, Salvador Perez of the Royals. That's fine, whatever. Yuli Gurriel at first base for the Astros. Um, I, I don't feel that good about it. I haven't watched that much of him, so I don't know. Uh, Matt Olson of the A's, very well deserved, has won the war before. Rightly deserved, very, very good defensive first baseman. And Jared Walsh of the Angels, fine, whatever. Um, second base, David Fletcher of the Angels with Maryville of the Royals. Marcus Simeon of the Blue Jays, sure, fine. Third base, Matt Chapman of the A's. Yeah, why do you even nominate anybody else? Because he's obviously going to win it. Um, Jose Ramirez of the Indians. And Joey Wendell of the Rays? Really? A Rays player, a finalist for a gold glove? No. No, I don't think so, unless it's Kevin Kiermaier. Um, but at shortstop, Carlos Correa of the Astros. Sure. J.P. Crawford of the Mariners. Fine, I'll grant you that one. And Anderson Simmons of the Twins. Now, this is the one that I have the problem with. Anderson Simmons is 32 years old. He used to be by far and away the best defensive player in baseball. He was absolutely a vacuum at shortstop, like just incredible value at defense for a shortstop. But he's 32 years old. He's fallen off a smidge the last couple of years, and is just this is just a reputation pick alone. Like it, it's a merited reputation. He's won the platinum glove multiple times and deserved it. Um, but he's not quite there. He's not quite at the same level that he's been. Um, and I don't think he deserves this domination. JP Crawford of the Mariners had a pretty solid defensive year, but um, it wasn't quite, it wasn't quite for the same standards. Carlos Correa, um, according to baseball reference, had the highest D war of any player in major league baseball this year with a 2.9 D war. So I can't really, you know, I can't really say, oh, yeah, no, he didn't deserve it. He also had a 7.1 war in total. Um, so that's pretty pretty solid, pretty deserving. Um, but Isaiah Kyle Falefa was number five in defensive war, according to baseball reference, in all of Major League Baseball, every single position, not just American League shortstops, but every single position. He had a 2.2 defensive war, um, was fantastic in that category. He had a four war season, which, you know, really impressive for a guy that not a lot of was thought of. Um, just a really solid defensive player. Yeah, uh, maybe if you if you care a lot about errors, he was charged with quite a few errors. But uh, errors should be done away with. They are not good indicators for how good a player is. He had 19 errors. But how many of those were throwing errors? A decent percentage of them. And how many of those should not have been throwing errors? Because if he had a decent defensive first baseman, they would have caught his errors. It's slightly not perfect throws, a lot of them. How many errors was Nathaniel Lowe charged with defensively? Not nearly enough. A lot of those errors that were on throws by IKF were not really his fault. They were fine, decent throws, plays that a lot of shortstops wouldn't have even gotten to. And so penalizing him for getting the balls that a lot of 
shortstops wouldn't even gotten to just bothers the heck out of me. It def- defense is one of the hardest things to judge, but it's also one of the like just worst judged things. Like I know it's hard, but like also there's not a whole lot of effort put in. And these gold glove awards are honestly so frustrating, so meaningless. Eric Hosmer has multiple gold gloves at first base. He is terrible. One of the fir- worst defensive first basemen in baseball. And even was a bad defensive first baseman when he won those awards. It's like, what are these guys thinking? It's like, oh, okay. Well, this guy uh, hit really well, so let's g- reward him with a defensive award. Like, what? In what sport would that make sense? An all-defensive player, like, well, let's see how well he did offensively. Like, no, that's not how it works. If you're not going to take this award voting seriously, then don't get a vote. I don't know who is getting these votes. I don't have any idea. I don't think it's the players. I don't think it's the coaches. I don't think it's anybody who actually knows what defensive value is. Otherwise, they would have put IKF up there. They obviously realized that he was good enough to deserve the award last year. And he was definitely good enough to deserve it this year as a full-time shortstop. But whatever. You know who else was was snubbed? Let's, let's just read left field. We got Randy Rosarena of the Rays. Not a good defensive player. Not really good at all. Um, we had Andrew Benintendi of the Royals. Not good defensive player. Lourdes Gurriel Jr. of the Blue Jays. I don't know. Maybe he's fine. Maybe you could have put Adolis Garcia there, who is significantly better than any of these guys. I feel like just giving an award to specifically each position, a lot of guys these days play multiple outfield positions, usually all of them if they're good. Um, So why they didn't get him there, I don't know. Also, Joey Gallo played mostly left field for the entire back half of the season. Could they have put him there? Maybe. I don't know. But center field, you have Kevin Kiermaier, the Rays. Fine. Solid. Decent. Miles Straw of uh, the Cleveland Guardians, who are being sued for being named the Guardians by a roller derby team, which is just kind of hilarious. Um, and Michael A. Taylor of the Royals, who had a really good defensive season. Kevin Kiermaier is another reputation alone. He had a fine defensive season this year, but not nearly to the level of Adoles Garcia. Not even close. Adoles Garcia was fantastic. He led the entire Major League Baseball in outfield assist. He was tied with 16 with Hunter Renfro. Um, but Hunter Renfro was not even close. I, let's look at the right fielders first before I go off on this rant. Hunter Renfro, you know, decent arm, fine angles, playing a hard right field in Boston. That's tough. Um, Kyle Tucker, fine. And Joey Gallo, of course, I have no problem with Joey Gallo being nominated. Um, but Kyle Tucker, I don't think, deserves it. Hunter Renfro is fine, but a lot of... A whole lot of uh, Adoles Garcia's time in the outfield this year came in center field, so he could have been nominated there. He could have been nominated in left field, where he played a pretty decent amount. Um, but, you know, I guess they put him in right field. He played center field 79 games this season, um, left field 9 games, so maybe not that, and uh, right field 51 games. So it's the center fielders that I have to have beef with. But Let's let's just compare him to the right field because that's what he's playing towards the back half of the season when Leody was up, and that's where he's probably going to be play playing going forward. Now they both had 16 assists, him and Hunter Renfro. Uh, but Adolis Garcia had four errors versus Hunter Renfro's 12 errors. Now I just went off on how errors aren't usually you know a good metric, but when someone has four times as many errors as somebody else, you'd think, oh okay, like that's probably an indicator that uh, the other player who had a third as many errors is probably better. Um, then we look at some of these other advanced numbers that baseball reference have, um, total zone rating, total fielding runs above average, um, total fielding runs above average per something innings, um, fielding zone runs, runs above average, average, uh, defensive runs safe across the board. Adolis is way, way better than Hunter Renfro or some of these other guys. Uh, Adolis has, uh, a total runs field it above average of 17 uh where hunter renfro is negative eight um zone rating uh has a positive nine adoles does and hunter renfro a negative eight there as well um defensive runs saved 16 for adoles negative one for hunter renfro these are not these are not close numbers like all of these plus minus Fielding runs above average, uh, Adolis is plus five, and Hunter Renfro is minus four. I don't know what numbers they were looking at, um, but 
Adolis Garcia deserves to be in this conversation. He had a phenomenal defensive year, was electric playing defense, not just good, but electric and fascinating and just completely fun to watch. I don't understand what the heck these voters were looking at. He got absolutely hosed, and I will not get over it. Unless Joey Gallo wins the right field gold glove, which he probably won't um, because they're just going to give it to Kyle Tucker because he had a good offensive season or Hunter Renfro because he had all those assists. Don't don't mind the 12 errors that he had. It's fine. I'm fine. I'm not fine. I'm angry. This is wrong. Both these players were hosed. The gold glove is a sham, and it makes me angry every single year, and it's going to continue to make me angry. And it's worthless if you're not giving it to the right people or even putting the right people as finalists. That's it. I'm done with this stupid gold glove crap. But I'm going to take a quick break. Hear this word from our sponsor when we come back. I'm going to hear what our insiders have to say about game two of the World Series, which unfortunately the Astros won. Coming up, grab this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever increasing number of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock everything that you need. Are you going to endure all these questions and wait while the person behind the counter orders parts on their computer choosing the only brand their warehouse happens scary? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why would you spend up to 30, 50, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are reliably low for everybody. Every single customer, they've got everything you need. So go explore their easy to use website today to find the solution to your auto part needs. Go to rockauto.com right now to see all the parts available for your car, truck, right locked on in their How You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. Now, the Astros won 7 2 in game two of the World Series last night. A very upsetting game, a very fairly one sided game. But the series moves to Atlanta. Hopefully, some of the final ever non-DH Major League Baseball games we will ever get are going to happen. And uh, let's see what our insiders had to say on what Game 2 did for this series. Welcome to another Locked on MLB Insider Report. Joining me today is our MLB Insider, Gordon Beckham, and we're going to have some instant reaction to Game 2 of the World Series. Gordon, it was another good one, but this time the Astros come out on top. The series is now tied 1-1. Astros won with a final score of 7-2. to two. What did you like about what you saw from the Astros tonight compared to Game 1? I think the Astros kind of shook off the rust they had in game one, and then they came right back and decided to go mm -hmm. up one nothing in the first inning. Granted, uh, Atlanta answered in the top of the second, but they didn't stop there. They just kept getting runs. And uh, I think that uh, what you saw was the Astros kind of basically picking up the slack from having three days off. I mean, nobody really wants to talk about it, but three days off in baseball world is, is a lot. It's a lot to get on the other side of. And for them to come back in game two and look like they did, they look hungry. I mean, they, they clearly looked like they wanted to answer the bell, answer the call that the Braves basically uh, did in game one. So it's making, uh, making its way to be a very good series, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. The Braves, on the other hand, didn't look as energetic or as sharp as they have really throughout this this postseason. Is that something that you noticed as well? The, the thing that stood out to me for the Braves, especially defensively, is how mm -hmm. sloppy they were tonight. They, they, they didn't look in sync. They didn't look like they were covering bases. I mean, there was a base hit that scored a run. Um, and Swanson didn't even cover third base, almost looking like he had forgotten that he needed to be there, which is that his, that's his uh, – yeah, that's where he's got to be on a base hit to left field. The third baseman is always going to be in there for the cut. Swanson didn't get over there. Now, Rosario didn't have to throw the ball that he did because the guy was going to probably get to third base, but Swanson did not. He kind of shut down. You could tell the way he uh, was grounding, kind of getting towards third base. He shut down mentally and then was like, oh, I got to get to third base. It was too late. Rosario threw the ball away. Another run scores. Later in the game, Ozzie, um, Albies on a double play ball possibly could save could have saved a run. Uh, he botches a throw and they end up uh, not getting the double play to end the inning. So those are two runs that it, a five to two ball game is a lot different than a five to or 
excuse me, a seven to two ball game. And uh, those small things add up. It just didn't look like the Braves were in sync. I mean, they're just, they, they did some uncharacteristic things for them uh, tonight. And uh, I don't know if it was a lapse of, of judgment or a lapse of just not being ready for the play. Uh, but either way, um, there were some mistakes to be had um, in the game that definitely made the game out of reach versus still still kind of in the balance. Gordon, both starting pitchers in Jose Urquidy and Max Freed went five innings, which is something that's going to be very important, not only as it was to game two, but as we move forward in this series. So talk a little bit about both of their performances and what going that five innings is going to mean for both of these bullpens. Yeah, Urquidy did a good job of like getting five innings. He looked great tonight. He kept the Braves mm-hmm. off balance. He kept them off the bases. I mean, did a very good job. Uh, Max Free did just as good of a good job having a bad night. And I, I think a lot of people are going to be like, what do you mean? He gave up six runs. It's like, no. Uh, he, he was able to battle through and give up these runs while saving bullpen. So they really didn't, the Braves did not really use anybody that they consider the guy uh, at the end of the game. You know, I mean, Chavez could probably be in the mix for one of those positions, but either way, um, they didn't use any of their bullpen arms. So they give these guys rest, right? And so that was important. I guarantee you Brian Snicker was thinking about that. And he's probably just telling Max Freed, hey, you got to go out there and give us innings. I don't care if we lose this game 15 to one, somehow find a way to give us innings because we've got to get back to Atlanta and not have our bullpen completely spent tonight. So I would say incredible job by Urquidy. I really think it, I mean, a much better job than Max Freed. But when you look on the, like a deeper on the, you know, from the surface of it, Max Freed did a really good job to kind of reset that bullpen. So I think Braves fans should feel good about that. But Urquidy and the rest of the guys in the Astros, they just showed up to play. And I mean, they, they, they showed why they're, probably the favorite in this uh, in this World Series, even after losing game one. Gordon, you mentioned that this series is heading back to Atlanta for game three, and I'm sure that is exactly what the Braves wanted to do, considering that they are undefeated at home during the postseason. So I'd imagine that you think the Astros are going to have to bring their A game plus some if they want to steal one in Atlanta. Yeah, the Braves have been rolling at home, right? I mean, I live here in Atlanta. The 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 feeling is palpable in and around Atlanta. You walk around, guys are asking me questions about like what's going on, what are we going to do, and I, it's it's kind of interesting because I don't really have a uh, I play for the Braves, but I don't really have a uh, a horse in this race. So um, it's interesting. I think that after Game One, I was like, Braves look really good, you know, but. Going back to Atlanta, they should feel really good because they've what five five and no last uh, five they played in uh, in Truist Park. I think that there's an interesting like uh, it's just palpable what's going on in the city. I mean, listen, they haven't won a World Series since 1995, and they've always kind of been in the mix. I mean, there was a there's a stretch there even when I played for the Braves, they weren't in contention, but. Now they're kind of in the mix, and so you can you can just feel people in and around the city of Atlanta just feel like this is our year. It's kind of a weird year to be because there's no nobody was saying, "Hey, the Braves are going to win it." Um, but now they're all of a sudden, you know, they're they're sneaking around and doing that. But they've got to get past a Houston team that is legitimate, and they're legitimate not only on the mound. Their 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 lineup is so good, and now the Braves don't have the kind of element of surprise. I always think that like when you have that many games off. When you have three days off and then you play, so it's almost four days since you've played a real live game, it takes a little bit of time. Well, the Astros showed up and answered the bell, and so they're right back where they need to be. Now it's just a regular off day and back playing. So I think that what you're going to see is an Astros team that's going to be tough to beat. Um, I don't know if they'll buck the trend in Atlanta, but it wouldn't shock me if they did. How exactly do you think the Braves have to respond in this situation? Same way they've responded all postseason. I mean, just every time they've gotten hit in the mouth, they basically just come right back and 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 did some hitting of their own. So, yeah. it, you know, somebody punches them, they're punching right back. And I think that's the, been the thing. So what I would key on if you're watching this game, um, you know, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday, especially Friday, is it, number one, the weather is going to be cold. It's going to be 55 degrees and 15 mile per hour winds. Houston's not used to it. The Braves are not used to it. So that's something that's going to play a factor uh, in that game. But also, if you see that the Braves punch back really early, I think that's a really good sign if you're a Braves fan. If you see the Astros go up without a Braves answer real real quick, you should be worried uh, moving into game four if you're a Braves fan. Because basically, the, the, uh, the Astros are 
they're they're no joke. I mean, they know how to hit. Yeah. They know how to go out and compete. They've been here. They have the the veteran presence in the playoffs. They've done been here. They've done that. The Braves are kind of you know unproven in a lot of ways, but there's a lot of people here in Atlanta I know that feel like they're going to do it. Gordon, I couldn't help but smile that whole time. I know that you spent some time in Detroit as well, and when you said it's going to be cold, it's going to be 55. I was like, I was expecting you to say like 30 or something. You know? Hey, the, hey, the the wind chill <laughs> is going to be a real deal. I mean, I'm All telling right, you, I it's know, supposed 15 to be 15 miles per hour. hour. Yeah. I remember in 2019, we opened the season and it was 33 degrees. It took nothing away from Chicago and we'd open that season. Um, but I'm telling you, uh, this is not that, but it is going to be cool you. when these guys are not used to it. Uh, I believe you. I believe you. It's just, it, it's funny. And I, I just remember Miguel Cabrera hitting his first home run this season in, in the, the snow. snow and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's great, though. But it is definitely going to be a factor. I totally agree with you there, especially being Houston in Atlanta. You're not used to the cold you're weather. Like that. They're not. Yeah, they're you're not, not. You're not. They're not tough like the Tigers and the White Sox. Yeah. I know all about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's take a look for the, the last question, Gordon, at the pitching matchup that we're expecting to see in game three. Luis Garcia on the mound for the Astros and Ian Anderson on the mound for the Braves. Who do you like in that matchup? Yeah, Garcia has been really good. I feel like he's just yeah. uh, I've watched him in the in the regular season, too. He's got some stuff. He's got great hair. Mm -hmm. um, so does so does Ian Anderson, although he looks like Marv from uh, Home Alone. So um, I don't know who's going to be uh, winning. If it was Christmas, I would say it's definitely going to be the Braves because of Ian Anderson and uh, his look. But I, listen, at the end of the day, uh, Garcia is really good. And Ian Anderson is, too. I think you give the edge to Garcia because of what his stuff is. Mm -hmm. It's just better than Ian Anderson's. But Ian Anderson knows how to pitch, So, and it's in his own park. He struggled a little bit um, when – when they played the Dodgers at home the first time, and then he kind of rebounded the second time. So I think that when when you're doing that, he's kind of learning from his mistakes. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, he comes out and does. But I think that he'll 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 that I think they'll both have good games. I think this will be a low scoring game on Friday, and uh, just one or two things defensively or offensively are going to get this thing done. It really is shaping up to be a great World Series, Gordon. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me tonight and recap that game too. Of course. Great to see you, Danielle. Yes, great to see you and all of you. There will be more to come later this week as this series heads to Atlanta. And for everything you need to know from both teams, stay tuned to Locked On Astros and Locked On Braves. For all of you, more coming later this week when the series shifts to Atlanta. And for everything you need to know up until then, make sure you stay tuned to Locked On Astros and Locked On Braves. I'm Daniela Bruce. He's Gordon Beckham. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be back with more Locked On, your team every day. Well, that was definitely some great insight from Gordon Beckham. Uh, thanks to all those fine folks uh, for providing all of us that information. I'm going to take a quick break. We can come back and look a little bit more at what's going to happen the rest of this World Series and a potentially new name for a bullpen coming up right after this word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. We're back in better than ever, a new web interface for the start of basketball season and more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website, sign up today, receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code Locked On to receive your bonus. From basketball, football, baseball, postseason, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online, where the game starts. Now, I don't normally reference things that uh, PETA says on this show, um, but sometimes when they're just so funny, I can't help but but use it. You know, PETA is they have a, a very weird way about going about their business, and you know, there's a lot of problems with them, um, but. PETA's call to the bullpen is to rename the outdated term, the arm barn, which like at first thought you're like, okay, PETA, just shut up. It's a bullpen. The bulls aren't watching. There's no even, there's not even a team in major league baseball called the bulls. And like the bulls aren't watching. The cows aren't watching baseball. They, they don't care what the bullpen is called. Also they hang out there. So it's their home. So they're probably like, okay, sure. 
I guess they're they're bulls in there. So cool. They're some of our people. Why is that a derogatory term? But then they come out with the term arm barn, which is just just fantastic. You know, like Bulp has been pretty good for years, but the arm barn is just it sounds like a discount warehouse where you buy appendages that are used, like not retail prices for appendages. Like maybe it's like a prosthetics thing. Maybe it's like an actual human arm things. I don't know, but it sounds intriguing. It sounds mysterious. It sounds ridiculous, which I love. And it sounds weird, which, you know, is fitting because relievers are really freaking weird. I mean, even Taylor Hearn, who is no longer a reliever, I think very clearly a starter for this team, tweeted out um, a video of blazing saddles of like me coming out of the arm barn, um, which is just absolutely hilarious. Um, Taylor Hearn's Twitter is, I I'd say, among the best, if not the best on the team. I feel pretty confident in saying that. A great Twitter presence uh, from Taylor Hearn. But like, you know what? I might actually be in favor of this. I might just start calling it the arm barn because it's ridiculous. It's fun. It's just so silly that I like not even a credit to PETA, just like credit to whoever came up with that term at PETA, that one specific person, not to the organization, not to their many other flaws um, and hypocrisies, but like the arm barn. Thank you for your one gift to humanity. Other than your other, you know, changing a, a term that didn't really need. Well, maybe that one needed changing more instead of using the term beating a dead horse, feeding a fed horse. I feel like that's fun and silly. So um, also my favorite podcast host, Katie, no one uses that a lot. So, you know, shout out to her and shout out to Peter for that one. Those, these two specific things, the arm barn and feeding a fed horse. That is just a perfect way to end this silly, ridiculous episode. I'll be back tomorrow with episode with Grant Schiller, the OG prospect whisperer baseball guru insightful man extraordinaire thank you for making locked on rangers your first listen of the day and until next time don't forget to enjoy some arm barns and don't forget to enjoy some world series baseball <laughs>